the continuous aspect disappears and is replaced by the discontinuous behavior which we have already seen is typical of quantum theory. However, if we try to apply to gravitation these ideas of quantum theory, we find that they do not fit properly. What modification is needed is not yet known. One root of the difficulty is that if we try to make quantum theory accord with the general theory of relativity, then gravitation is not to be neglected, so that the curvature of space-time will depend on the whereabouts of the atoms. However, the quantum theory makes it quite clear that we cannot always know where the atoms are. Finally, we come to geography, in which I include history. The separation of history from geography rests upon the separation of time from space. When we amalgamate the two in space-time, we need one word to describe the combination of geography and history. For the sake of simplicity, I shall call it geography. Geography, in this sense, includes everything that, as a matter of crude fact, distinguishes one part of space-time from another. We are already in a position to calculate the large facts about the solar system backwards and forwards for vast periods of time. But in all such calculations we need a basis of crude fact. The facts are interconnected, but facts can only be inferred from other facts, not from general laws alone. Thus the facts of geography have a certain independent status in physics. No amount of physical laws will enable us to infer a physical fact unless we know other facts as data for our inference. And here, when I speak of facts, I am thinking of particular facts of geography, in the extended sense in which I am using the term. In the theory of relativity, we are concerned with structure, not with the material of which the structure is composed. In geography, on the other hand, the material is relevant. If there is to be any difference between one place and another, there must either be differences between the material in one place and that in another, or places where there is material and places where there is none. The former of these alternatives seems the more satisfactory. We might try to say there are electrons and protons and the other subatomic particles, and the rest is empty. But in the empty regions there are light waves, so that we cannot say that there is nothing there. According to quantum theory, we cannot even say exactly where things are, but only that one place is more likely than another to find an electron in. In any case, events are occurring wherever there are likely to be light waves or particles. That is all that we can say for the places where there is likely to be energy in one form or another, since energy has turned out to be a mathematical construction built out of events. We may say, therefore, that there are events everywhere in space-time, but they must be of a somewhat different kind, according as we are dealing with a region where there is very likely to be an electron or proton, or with the sort of region we should ordinarily call empty. But as to the intrinsic nature of these events, we can know nothing, except when they happen to be events in our own lives. If events are fundamental then what of the traditional concept of force, so vital to Newtonian mechanics? In the Newtonian system, bodies under the action of no forces move in straight lines with uniform velocity. When bodies do not move in this way, their change of motion is ascribed to a force. Some forces seem intelligible to our imagination, those exerted by obvious pushing or pulling. Our imaginative understanding of these processes is quite fallacious. All that it really means is that past experience enables us to foresee more or less what is going to happen. But the forces involved in gravitation and in the less familiar form of electrical action do not seem in this way natural. It seems odd that the earth can float in a void. The natural thing is to suppose that it must fall. The Newtonian theory, in addition to action at a distance, introduced two other imaginative novelties. The first was that gravitation is not always and essentially downwards, i.e. towards the centre of the earth. The second was that a body going round and round in a circle with uniform velocity is not moving uniformly, 
but is perpetually being turned out of the straight course towards the centre of the circle, which requires a force pulling it in that direction. Hence Newton arrived at the view that the planets are attracted to the sun by a force, which is called gravitation. This whole point of view is superseded by relativity. There are no longer such things as straight lines in the old geometrical sense. There are geodesics, but these involve time as well as space. Just as the sea does not cause the water in a river to run towards it, but the water moves according to the nature of the riverbed at any particular point, so the sun does not cause the planets to move round it. The planets move round the sun because that is the easiest thing to do, in the technical sense of least action. It is the easiest thing to do because of the nature of the region in which they are, not because of an influence emanating from the sun. The supposed necessity of attributing gravitation to a force attracting the planets towards the sun has arisen from the determination to preserve Euclidean geometry at all costs. If we find bodies not moving in what we insist upon regarding as straight lines, we shall demand a cause for this behaviour. The name given to any agency which causes deviation from uniform motion in a straight line is force, according to the Newtonian definition of force. Hence, the agency invoked through your insistence on the Euclidean formula for interval is described as a force. If people were to learn to conceive the world in the new way, without the old notion of force, it would alter not only their physical imagination, but probably also their morals and politics. In the Newtonian theory of the solar system, the sun seems like a monarch whose behests the planets have to obey. In the Einsteinian world, there is more individualism and less government than in the Newtonian. There is also far less hustle. Laziness is the fundamental lord of the Einsteinian universe. The abolition of force seems to be connected with the substitution of sight for touch as the source of physical ideas. When an image in a mirror moves, we do not think that something has pushed it. But obviously, something happens when an image in a looking-glass moves. From the point of view of sight, the event seems just as real as if it were not in a mirror. But nothing has happened from the point of view of touch or hearing. This is equally true of the astronomical world. It makes no noise, because sound cannot travel across a vacuum. So far as we know, it causes no feelings, because there is no one on the spot to feel it. The astronomical world, therefore, seems hardly more real or solid than the world in the looking-glass, and has just as little need of force to make it move. This may sound like wordplay or sophistry. After all, you may say, the image in the mirror is the reflection of something solid. It cannot indulge in behaviour of its own. It has to copy the real world. This shows how different the image is from the sun and the planets, because they are not obliged to be perpetually imitating a prototype. So you'd better give up pretending that an image is just as real as one of the heavenly bodies. There is, of course, some truth in this. The point is to discover exactly what truth. In the first place, images are not imaginary. When you see an image, certain perfectly real light waves reach your eye. And if you hang a cloth over the mirror, these light waves cease to exist. There is, however, a purely optical difference between an image and a real thing. The optical difference is bound up with this question of imitation. When you hang a cloth over the mirror, it makes no difference to the real object. But when you move the real